I'm Gray Montrose. I, until very, very recently, was a law professor at William & Mary, um, and we bought a farm in Henrico County uh, a couple years ago and inherited a pirate trail. And that was a new experience for me as a landowner. Um, at this event, I think we've identified sort of three categories of efforts. We have sort of trail identification, we have trail stewardship, and then we have liability, which is not something that everybody intuitively thinks about, especially when you're on like state land, park land. That's something just kind of outside the framework. Um, but especially when you're involved in private land and folks are private landowners going, am I responsible for anything? What do I have to do? What's involved with this? What if, you know, my dog on my property bites somebody who he's concerned about crossing our property? Uh, what if somebody falls and hurts themselves? Um, also, please protest. I don't mind if anybody uh, relieves themselves on my property, but please wipe with something biodegradable. <laughs> that is one of our biggest issues, let me tell you. But um, anyway, um, at, at our policy center, I had a couple of students. I said, hey, guys, do you want to work on this? Let's do a policy analysis of trail liability, especially right here in Virginia. So identifying a couple of issues. Um, I know other folks have talked about kind of working through this and saying, how do we responsibly manage these trails, especially when a lot of the ways that trails get created is not necessarily the folks that act who are getting out there and creating the trails and doing it in an intentional way, but people who are wandering off the trails and saying, I think that ought to be a trail. I'm going to take my chainsaw and make a trail. And those are some of the challenges, again, especially for landowners who are like, whoa, whoa wait, wait, this is my property. And I have had multiple uh, high up folks with local conservation agencies swear to me. This is a public trail. I'm like, nope, I pay taxes on it. You can look at my deed. That is not a public access trail. And there's some, some tension there. So our task was looking at, does Virginia's recreational use statute, anybody in this room know that Virginia has recreational use statute? Crickets. Um, does it provide a workable framework for landowner concerns over liability for trail use injuries? Thinking about, again, we've heard it a lot, the COVID pandemic, people were like, I would like to recreate outdoors. It is a safe way to find some happiness, which is a good thing. Look at four separate issues. When is a landowner relieved of their duty to keep premises safe? Is it possible for landowners to receive direct or indirect compensation for opening up their land to the public? Does the statute protect public and private entities equally? And does the general public know about the statute? I think we just answered that last question. Our research process, we looked at recreational use statutes in the United States, looking at a couple of different what we call regimes. What are we thinking about? What are the sort of bubbles in which people's laws fall? Looking at case law here in Virginia, there are two, two cases. Utilizing our secondary sources and, and conducting some interviews with trail professionals here in the area. So this is a map here, the Friends of the Lower Appomattox. They do an amazing job, terribly impressive people. All right, so this is the Virginia Recreational Use Statute, Virginia Code Annotated 29.1-509. Landowners shall owe no duty of care to keep land safe, hunting, fishing, trapping, camping, and a whole long list that includes something, I think it actually includes skydiving. Not sure. <laughs> any other recreational use is the important language. Anything that is not, we list a lot of things and everything else too. We mean everything. Ingress and egress over land to permit passage to other property used for recreational purposes. This was created in the 1980s to help farmers in particular, folks who were suffering an economic downturn, particularly affected, saying, hey, um, I would like to open up, say, my pond for fishing. Can I do that? Yeah, well, they're going to have to cross my neighbor's land. All right, we're going to indemnify your, labor, your neighbor to walk across their property to come to your property to fish. And that way, potentially, we're getting more people to more places generating revenue. Thank you. When we do that, um, uh, we're also thinking about um, trails, as in, like, I'm crossing this property and I'm still crossing a different property, and I'm still crossing a different property, we have this sort of linear continuation to get to the recreational use. So we are having a continuation of our recreational use across land. Thinking about um, use of an easement granted to the Commonwealth or a not-for-profit. So if you donate an easement, you've also shifted your liability to another entity. 
This applies regardless of whether the landowner grants permission to use. And a lot of folks are like, cool, that's great. So I can just go anywhere. Please don't. But theoretically, and this is the paradox that is important to think about, and we'll touch on this more, in heavy, heavy property rights states, this is my property, this is my space, this is my castle, important language there, don't come on my property, tend to have the broadest release of liability. So if you're doing anything fun and you go on someone else's property, you are on your own. And whatever happens to you, the risk is that you're is shifted more to you than to the landowner. So people are like, oh, I have permission. You don't have permission. And you're really on your own if anything happens. So uh, it doesn't limit liability that may arise when a landowner receives a fee. So if I start charging for you to come to my property for whatever reason, all of a sudden I have to go start buying liability insurance. That's a big important caveat for people that are allowing, say, glamping on their property, or they have like a bike shed kiosk that they're selling things for folks to access. All of a sudden you get a fee for use of the premises, that liability protection goes away. Does not limit for gross negligence. Gross negligence is a legal term of art. It means basically really, really bad things. Like if you have a giant and gaping hole in the ground and you cover it up with brush and you're like, yeah, nobody will fall into that. And they do. It's kind of touching on gross negligence. All right. So this idea of recreational purpose, there are two cases in Virginia that deal with this. Harlan v. Norfolk Fest events. The idea is subjective intent of the land user, not the land owner, the land user. In this particular case, someone was employed by an event. They were hired to be there and they got injured. They were not there for recreational purposes. They were there to work. So the fest events ended up being liable. Virginia Beach v. Flippin. A woman was injured trying to retrieve a dog on someone else's property. And the court was like, no, you're, you were there to supervise your kids while they were rafting. You were there for a recreational purpose, therefore no liability. That's all we've got. It is relatively untested for a law that's been around for coming up on 40 years, something like that. To have two cases that touch on it is remarkable. So that tells you how much uncertainty is out there about land use liability. Like I said, there's broad and narrow approach. You can see, thinking about the politics of these locations, what I'm talking about with the idea of the broader the protections, the more you are on your own when you are out there. So thinking about the responsibility of a landowner, the more the more property rights the estate is, the more likely that liability will be on you as the user, not the landowner. You can receive compensation to what extent, what types. Um, compensation may be direct, which is less common. Indirect, more common. So an admission fee, profit making, probably not going to qualify for the liability protections here. But things like tax incentives, tax deductions. Um, I'm currently participating in a tax scheme for the land use on my property to say I'm keeping it open space and they allow me to pay lower taxes because of that use, which is of greater benefit to the whole county. That's a cool thing. Why is compensation worth considering? Well, it sure builds goodwill with landowners, right? If I have to clean up all the wet wipes and all the trash and all the and deal with all the issues from people accessing this pirate trail, maybe an incentive isn't such a bad idea. Definitely potentially cover some costs and infrastructure issues, things like floating docks, things like gravel. Um, we have an access, a trailhead that thankfully Dominion, in their wisdom, puts down some gravel, which it also makes it super visible to people, but whatever. And then habitat and wildlife protection. Thinking about, hey, I put my property, it's an old growth forest, so please don't cross my property with chainsaws, but um, to be able to sort of put up signs and say, don't touch this, or hey, this is a protected area. These particular plants are very delicate. Please don't go off trail, things like that. So compensation is worth considering, especially this idea of indirect compensation. So here's an example, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, put forward this program, the 2018 Farm Bill, $50 million, uh, specifically for private land projects, meant to encourage landowners to allow public access for wildlife-dependent recreation, hunting, fishing, wildlife viewing, bird watching, huge fan of bird watching, allowing um, folks to receive direct rental payments, which possibly would get us out of the scheme here in Virginia, but again, worth considering. 
as well as technical and conservation services, mm -hmm. people coming out to talk to you, people coming out to help you, people helping you maybe design a more resilient trail, things like that in return for habitat improvement. Um, those are more indirect services that probably would fly under Virginia's scheme. We looked at differences um, about protections for private landowners versus those owned by corporate entities, local and state government. There's this thing called sovereign immunity, which governments enjoy. Um, not really. Um, there's been some there's been some nosing around the edges of the issue, but basically everyone's treated the same. It's just a lot easier for a government to get things kicked out of court under sovereign immunity without even testing this statute. Big findings from our interviews, awareness, trail users don't know, land owners don't know, a lot of land trusts don't know about the liability regimes. They also don't have a lot of knowledge about private land use boundaries, private land boundaries. One of the schemes that has been successful, I will give you two quick examples, Pennsylvania purple paint law, Texas also does a purple paint law. And again, talking about, are you on your own? Texas allows you to defend your property in a much more vigorous way than we do here in Virginia. Um, but the purple paint law is basically you paint a stripe every couple of feet, you can't be more than hundred feet apart. Stripes have to be a certain size. Purple paint tells somebody when it's private property. And it's actually worked out really well from what we've heard in Pennsylvania. It's just a lot of awareness. And it creates this defiant trespasser enhancement where if somebody's like, I think I will go past this boundary, there is an enhanced punishment for folks that are making an intentional choice to go past that boundary. So that's interesting. Areas for future research, data collection, looking at indemnity clauses for things like easements, um, marketing strategies. Again, what can we do to increase awareness and help people be good self-stewards and help landowners be good trail stewards if they want to participate. I think there's a real opportunity for um, entities like OpenStreetMaps, um, other potential foundations to say, hey, we see that somebody has marked this as a private trail or inaccessible. They don't want people on there. We know that people are using those trails. We know what for. We know how often. We know how many people are on there. Is this an opportunity to say, hey, why do you want to close that down? What are you nervous about? Can we help? Can we arrange an easement? Can we bring on a friends of organization that will take over some of the stewardship responsibilities? How can we help? I think there's a really cool opportunity with so much of the data that we have access to through this program and others to identify opportunities to say, hey, you want this to be private? You want to shut down access? Let's talk about why and how can we help? Real opportunity there. Proactive approaches to trail development. And then potentially amending some of that statutory language um, if there is an opportunity for, say, compensation or we want to adjust those categories of liability. <laughs>